Good afternoon and welcome to the May webinar presented by the Recruitment, Training and Support Center at the Federation for Children with Special Needs. My name is Janie Kreko and I am the Training and Support Specialist at RTSC. Our technical producers today are Hannah Stalkamp and Renee Williams. Today's webinar is Understanding the Law and the Transition Planning Process helping your student get the most out of transition services. Our presenters today are Leslie Leslie, Project Coordinator at the Federation for Children with Special Needs, and me. Unfortunately, Paige Parisi was unable to join us today. We would also like to introduce Jennifer Stewart, our new transition specialist at the Federation. She joins us after recently working at EMARC in the Metro North region building capacity for school districts and adult service agencies. Jennifer has her master's in public policy and is currently a LEND fellow at the Shriver Center. She has worked in the field of youth development and disability services for many years and is bringing a unique systems level perspective to the Federation. She will be working on a new project called the Link Center, which will be a centralized resource for the state of Massachusetts around transition services, supports, and trends in the field. This is part two of a three-part RTSC series on transition to life after high school. Our June webinar is planned for June 16th. We will discuss a transition-focused IEP and will include helpful hints for infusing transition skill building throughout the IEP, including goal writing. During this webinar, please type your questions in the toolbox and feel free to engage with other attendees. We will leave time at the end of the hour to address the questions. If your question is not answered live, please send us an, send us an email and we will do our best to follow up with you. And lastly, if you are interested in learning more about the Federation, please go to our website at fcsn.org and explore all the different programs, including how to volunteer to become a special education surrogate parent. So at the outset here, I would just like to um, go through the webinar uh, outline. Um, and essentially, it's about the what and why and the process itself, including the transition planning form. We'll discuss what self-determination is um, according to IDEA and the state. Take a look at some of the assessments for transition and programs for older students who are 18 to 22. We'll briefly discuss Chapter 688, and then we'll talk about the graduation or the exit from high school. And I think at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. Leslie, thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to start off with what are transition services. Um, we're looking at students who are age 14 and older who are on an IEP, and they must receive services from the school to help to prepare them from moving from their high school environment to um, to life, to adult life. Uh, transition services are part of uh, FAPE, the Free and Appropriate Public Education, and they're always designed to meet the unique needs of the student. So I'm just going to revisit a little bit about uh, what is FAPE. Uh, all children with disabilities have available to them a free and appropriate public education. Um, they receive their services under an IEP, an individualized education plan. Um, FAPE is mostly defined by case law, um, and it's really making meaningful or effective progress according to the child's potential or the student's potential. It's not their maximum, uh, reaching their maximum or getting the maximum benefit, but it's, it's individualized and according to the child's potential. The U.S. Supreme Court has recognized the right of all ch uh, children uh, with disabilities, all handicapped children, to be able to achieve a degree of self-sufficiency. And I think this is an area where we all can agree that uh, part of the role of the school is to help a student be successful in life after um, school, is to get the services that they need within school to be able to be successful adults. The, in, in accordance with IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act, um, other federal courts have noted that in um, addition to 
the academic development within the school that transition services have a specific focus and that's to facilitate the student transitioning into an adult world and mostly we're dealing with uh, three areas post-secondary edu uh, education employment and independent community living um, so why is transition so important um, Jane I think you want to way in here yes okay so we're talking about the wide here um, and essentially transition um, as uh, high school is um, the mandate is to prepare the student for life outside the school environment um, the uh, the other side as I say when I present um, they've reached the other side um, and you want to be able to increase the ability of the, the student to be successful um, when they graduate uh, in, in all of outcomes in adult life and that's where specifically for kids um, in the foster care system have some difficulties they uh, need to develop those skills of self-determination and self-advocacy um, and, and at a very early age um, Massachusetts has the year of 14 as being the time when it's mandated but uh, when I do an orientation for special education surrogate parents I always suggest that it start earlier than that especially for self-advocacy and why is, it, is transition important um, and we'll talk about this in terms of the child welfare system Kids that age out of foster care or turn 18 and make the decisions um, to leave uh, foster care, um, now they have the, the possibility of staying within the system as a voluntary decision. But the, the kids that decide to leave are less likely to be employed. Um, they earn far less, about a third of what um, nationally a student would, learn, would earn um, after high school. We know, unfortunately, that the rate of homelessness among kids um, who are aging out of the foster care is quite high. 27% um, uh, is the national average in certain areas, especially in the inner cities. Um, it's higher than that. Um, and only 9% of former uh, foster care use complete college. Um, versus the 24% in the general population, which always surprises me. It's always lower than we imagine it is, um, but it's um, about um, almost a third less than the general population. So transition and DCF, um, we did have a, a webinar last month. Uh, Michelle Banks from DCF presented, and thank you so much, Michelle. Um, but she talked about the services that DCF offers now to kids who um, are uh, transitioning out of DCF and we want to just distinguish between transitioning from DCF and transitioning from high school it's really two different things with a lot of um, a lot of parallel uh, things going on but DCF encourages kids to continue in voluntary care beyond 18 they can actually stay in DCF care now until um, they reach uh, 21 um, and it's a great uh, way for them to continue in supported housing um, with uh, a roof over their head and three meals a, a day. Um, the adult, an adolescent, adolescent worker will be assigned to each student who is turning um, 18, and there's a lot of financial supports for housing um, and uh, higher education if they so choose to go to college and a new service or I guess an ongoing service is Family Find which is a way to safely um, find birth family. So essentially the bottom line, uh, two, two bottom lines is you can leave DCF but stay in school until 22 and you can leave school but stay in DCF until 21. Um, so that's kind of the, the two uh, points that we want to make for DCF and transition. So I, I think it's very important that we really focus on um, helping these students access transition services because uh, the outcome is very bleak right now unless they have the skills to be able to um, support themselves and access further education um, they're going to be limited in their options in employment and careers 
Um, and so it's very important um, that uh, anyone working with students um, help get the correct services, transition services that they're going to need. Um, it's really a coordinated set of activities. Um, the law states that it's designed to be a within a results-oriented process, um, not only focusing on the academic but the functional achievement. And this is where I think we need to um, step up our game and assist students in developing um, functional skills to get out into the community, to be gainfully employed, um, and to be part of the community. Um, so the services are facilitating them moving from school to post-school activities. Um, all of the transition services are going to be based uniquely on the student's needs, uh, taking into account their strengths, preferences, and interests. And a lot of students in the foster care system have never really been focusing on their strains. I think it's a unique time to work with a student. We're not talking about their um, needs and their disabilities so much as what are their strengths? What are their interests? What are, where do they want to go? Um, what is their you know, dream job? And they've never been asked these questions. And now people are going to start to listen. So when we're in a transition planning meeting, it's really focused on the student and their needs. Um, it's not only the instruction that they're going to be getting in school and the related services, but can we offer them some type of community experience um, so they can explore all the choices out there. Um, employment should be really a key focus during um, the transition service planning process. Um, and if appropriate, and I think for a lot of these students, those acquisition of daily living skills, money management, traveling, um, are all vital for them to be um, successful uh, as young adults in, in the community. So when we talk about the strengths and preference and interests of kids, um, and especially kids in the child welfare system, uh, we want to make sure that they have the ability to visualize the future. There's a kind of a quirky neurological thing that goes on with kids a lot of times that have been uh, the, the victims of um, early childhood complex trauma, and it's called a foreshortened future, where they actually cannot uh, neurologically understand what the future holds. Um, some people think it's because they don't understand the idea of being hopeful, um, but in any case, it's very important for the uh, adult supports in their life to help them to visualize what could become a hopeful future. Um, and the coaching piece is great, and this can be teachers, SESPs, um, visiting resources, uh, an older peer, um, to find out and talk to them about what do they like, what do they want to be when they grow up, uh, because this process of transition is all about the student. It's not about what other people feel is important for them to do or become. And um, you want to have high expectations from the start. Um, even a little little one in preschool um, will t probably tell you some outrageous idea about what they want to do when they grow up. But it's a seed. It's a seed that can grow um, and should be taken seriously and talked about on a regular basis. Um, there's lots of ways that Leslie and uh, Paige and I were talking about how to encourage kids in the system to kind of begin to think about their future. Um, I just recently saw a video about a young woman who grew up, um, she wasn't in the foster care system, but she had some mental health issues, and she created for herself a dream jar. I think, Leslie, you called it the dream jar. And when something would pop into her head about an interest of hers. She would put it into a jar. She'd fold it up and put it into a jar. And then every day she'd pull one out and think about it and maybe act on it. Um, I wish I had started my dream jar <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> I mean, even little kids can do that and carry it with them wherever they go through the system um, and continue to work on it and to build with it. And for this, this young woman who was um, in the YouTube, it, it said it saved her life. Um, she knew that there were possibilities out there. Um, and one of the things that we also talked about was, um, and I think I brought this up at one of my uh, presentations on trauma and learning, where I asked the audience to name 10 strengths for kids in the foster care system. And one of the ones that I do remember was their persistence. 
their ability to pers persist in getting what they need. Um, and that is really a way to self-advocate. Um, and they do need coaching, though, to make sure that the way they're trying to get what they need is, is an Well, I think that's the ideal role of the special ed surrogate parent is to help the student um, recognize their strengths. They're, these kids are very flexible. They're very resilient. Um, they, you know, they... They get what they want, and that's a great skill to have, uh, that persistence and that doggedness and try again. Um, I really believe in high expectations, that if you have high expectations, that will resonate well with the team. Um, and also the student will start to self-model that. If everyone's believing in them, then it's, it's going to carry the day. So we're now getting into the nitty gritty of the transition planning process. Um, the team will convene to develop an appropriate IEP. Um, that is the IEP where the student will turn um, age 14. So you can be in a planning process with a student at age 13 because the next um, IEP would um, be in place when the student is 14. Um, you're always allowed to start the transition planning process earlier. Um, if appropriate, and that might be appropriate for a lot of these students, is to really set them on a good path to success. Uh, if the student is not able to attend, um, what can you do to capture the student's um, you know, interests and ideas? And we talked about maybe having um, the student rip out um, pages from a magazine and create some kind of a portfolio or a poster um, so that they, their vision and their uh, preferences and interests are brought to the meeting. Um, we always want the student to participate for a small portion in the beginning um, as they're younger at age 14 and they may not be able to stay for the whole meeting or want to stay for the whole meeting but this is the first step in determining um, their future and that self-determination skill can be nurtured at the IEP meeting. Um, the team will use um, a mandated form called the transition planning form. I believe one was sent out to you um, as part of this webinar, but you can also access it from the uh, Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education's website. It's really a brainstorming tool for the whole team. Um, the notion that the team will sit down and start to think about where the student um, wants to go and what they want to do um, is going to take place before the IEP is uh, written so that the transition planning form will be completed before the IEP. It's going to help inform the IEP. It can be maintained in the student's folder and with the IEP, but technically it's not a part of it. If it's stapled to the IEP form, it doesn't happen. The information on the transition planning form must uh, be brought over to the IEP, that legal controlling document. So nothing that's on that uh, transition planning form is mandated to occur. It's, it should be very flexible. Um, it, should ha it should be brought to the team meeting every year, beginning when the IEP is in place at age 14. So you really should revisit this every year. Um, students at age 14 have a whole different set of ideas and expectations than when they're 16 or 18 or 20. Um, it will guide the whole discussion. And if you look at the planning form, the first thing um, on that form is the student's post-secondary vision. Um, what are their interests? That really should be guided by the student. It should be... Um, you know, written by the t the student um, in this in this team process. Um, then you'll move to the disability related needs. What are those skills that student is going to need to reach their vision? Is there um, a uh, specific skill that the team wants to identify, and that skill can be transferred over to the IEP as one of the um, goals? And this, the second uh, page of the planning form has an action plan. Um, it details in a lot of different areas how the student can um, prepare to achieve their vision of what they want to do with their life. Um, this action plan uh, can identify things that can happen in school um, for a lot of uh, 
students. Um, it might happen, uh, identify things that might happen in the community or in an employment setting. For students that are in the um, foster care system, they may not have as many options um, as other students. And so the, I think this is an area where the team needs to think creatively. And if something that uh, might be an independent living skill, you may want to identify who in the residential staff would be working on that and who would be reporting on it and who would be following the student to develop that skill in that setting. Um, so the important thing about the action plan is identifying, you know, how is this going to happen and who is going to be helping the student. And I just want to add to that, Leslie, that the action plan or the TPF is not necessarily all about the uh, people that are in this, the educational system. It can be an action plan that includes people in the community, as you said. Um, and um, I think, as you said, again, it's very important for kids who are in the foster care system to start their community um, planning at this point, especially if they're in residential placements. Um, so. Um, for the SESP um, to think kind of outside of the schoolhouse for that kind of thing um, and to get flex, uh, real creative on um, who's going to do what and um, who's responsible for supporting the student. So all of the information on the transition planning form will then be brought over into the IEP. Um, not everything, though. Um, it's just so that action plan might have things that happen outside of the school environment. The transition planning form under the action plan also specifically states um, that the plan should outline how the student can develop self-determination skills. And I think this is so key for the students in the system. They're going to have to advocate for themselves in a lot of different environments. Self-determination skills need to be taught and also there needs to be a plan within the school system for the student to use those skills so that they're practicing advocating for themselves, um, you know, defining their options, making those decisions. So um, it's not only academically, but functionally, we're now preparing them to move into post-secondary uh, life. Self-determination is really knowledge about who they are. Um, yes, and thank you, Leslie. Um, before we move forward, though, there is an interesting question, um, and um, I, I want to make clear that under, people understand this. They're ask, uh, someone's asking about the legal relationship of the TPF and the IEP. Um, the, as far as I know, the transition planning form uh, has, it has to be, a, it, Explain it to me. Okay, sorry. <laughs> it is a mandated form, state mandated form, so that the IEP team needs to use the form. Um, the form was developed to guide the discussion. Okay, so it's really a planning tool, a brainstorming tool. Um, I think it'll probably take a different tone in each student's individual team meeting because the student may be very, very clear on the vision. You don't have to spend a lot of time on that. And we maybe have identified the disability-related needs, but there might be some dis more discussion about the action plan and who's going to do what and where and whatever. But nothing on that form le is legally mandated to happen. And so we discourage the, the stapling it to an IEP. You need to transfer the information on that transition planning form directly onto the IEP. So the vision will go onto the vision part of the IEP. The disability skills that were identified on the planning form, um, not all of them may be transitioned into a specific goal, but I could really see a student who um, needs to have self-determination as a skill on their um, IEP, as a goal on their IEP, and then it will, how is that going to work within the school environment? And the team can determine that. And there might be some action items that might be for the student to even do and be supported in a residential setting. So it's not a legal form it's a planning tool. Thank you. And um, I think that um, if you see, if you look at your transition planning form that I sent, there's no place for a signature. So, um, but of course, the parent or the SESP, the guardian, must sign off on the IEP. So um, it's very important that anything on the transition planning form be placed into the IEP as a goal or elsewhere. On it. And that's going to be the focus of our third uh, webinar next month on how to integrate um, 
the uh, transition planning form into the IEP as a whole. I, I think the key is that you complete that form, that the form is present at the meeting um, and that it's completed. And actually, um, it may be um, possible for a student in a resource setting to work with their academic support team to go through that form so that they're very knowledgeable of what's on that form and what their role is in helping to complete that form. That's a great idea. Okay, so uh, we started to talk a little bit about self-determination. Um, and self-determination is a phrase that's been around for a long time, but it's becoming uh, more popular and um, people are putting more of a focus on it, especially since 2011 when the Massachusetts uh, Social and Emotional Learning Frameworks was, was developed. Self-determination is one of the goals of the framework. Um, and essentially, it's the ability to know who you are, what you want to be when you grow up, to make good choices and decisions and to advocate for those choices and decisions, to set goals, and to affect change um, according to what you want. Um, again, we have to deal with that um, lack of ability or a lack of capability to really grab onto the, uh, the future um, and what it can entail and hope hopefully and to hope that it will be successful. So um, for kids with trauma, that's an additional um, thing that they have to overcome and uh, learn to do. Um, so that's a, a very important skill for these kids. But you also have to understand your own strengths and your own challenges. Um, but knowing that, uh, knowing yourself well, that you'll be able to um, be as capable as, you're, as you can be. Um, anything else that you wanted to add to that, Leslie? No, I think that, that covers okay. it. Uh, okay, great. So we're moving on. Um, transition assessments. Um, transition assessments are uh, integral to the development of an IEP for students um, age 14 and above. It's required by IDEA, um, and so it helps really the team understand um, the student better to help in better planning. Um, it measures their current performance, the PLEP, the present level of uh, performance of a student, and can help the student um, then move into um, areas where they never saw that they had skills or defining skills. If they've identified a career track, you can use the assessments to find out where they currently are and what skills will they need to realize success in different areas. Um, it helps the team understand the student um, strengths, preference, and interests, and also some of those disability-related needs. We've got some really good questions coming in about self-determination. I knew it would start up a conversation here. So um, one of them is when we spoke about an action plan that include the residences. Um, and who is the person to um, kind of work with the residences um, or to be uh, to have that person be accountable um, and when you said to bring that up bring the action plan uh, or the transition planning form to the residents and we're talking about SESPs now um, or guardians um, so that the residential staff knows what their goals uh, might be and what their role in them can be. Um, and someone asked, is the caseworker um, involved in that? And I would say certainly um, that would be a, a collaborative effort on the part of all of the adults that are uh, supporting these kids in the congregate and residential facilities. Well, that would be the role of the SESP to communicate um, what's happening in the residential site, visit the residential site, um, or maybe at least uh, have a phone call and talk to them um, to kind of connect. Because we're, we're all really looking for data. How is the student doing? Is the student participating in the chores in the house? Is the student stepping up and doing their own laundry? Is the student, you know, learning how to cook? Um, if those those are skill areas that are defined in the action plan that the student um, will need, you know, life skills. How is that happening in the residential setting? So the um, SESP can contact the residential setting, talk to the people who are working with the student, and then bring that information back to help inform the IEP team. I mean, we're all right, really looking for information of where's the student at, what is their skill level, and how can we better support them. And so they, they're almost act well, they are acting as a liaison. Um, around the transition, um, the transition piece, um, because 
they, they are acting as the parent and, and so much of transition for a typical kid is the support of the parents. Um, another woman also asked a very uh, interesting question about how self-determination and self-regulation are um, kind of intertwined and it's very, very true. Um, it's hard to be making your own decisions and making good goals if your um, skills and self-regulation are poor. Um, and just, I, I think that would be an excellent action plan and essentially a very good transition goal to make sure that the student was working on self-regulation skills so that they could go out into the community and be able to um, activate self-determination. So, so ideally that would be defined as a disability related um, need or skill that was needed to be developed and worked on and can be brought over into the IEP specifically addressed and people within the school environment whether it be a psychologist or some other type type of behavioral support person could step into that role. Um, maybe some peer modeling there, um, because they may not have that peer um, model within their residential setting, but we probably can find it in the school. Um, there, that's where the opportunity to be creative in this planning process and this um, setting to be able to provide the supports and services for that individual student that they would need. So we're moving on within transition assessments. Um, although they're, quote, required to happen, um, everyone's always asking, what's the, the assessment? What's the vocational functional assessment that I need to get for my student? And it's really not one specific test. There are lots of tests out there. Um, so all of the special education evaluations that are happening when you think about it, beginning at age 14, they all should be transition related. Every evaluation, every test that is happening um, should be with that transition focus. Um, lots of information is being taken in by the school. Um, informal assessments are very, very valuable. These are people who are working with the student probably, you know, many hours in the day. They can see that their time management um, and their skill base and their executive function skills, you know, can they turn in papers on time? Are they managing their classes? Um, are they completing the work? Or are they showing up? Um, all of those informal kinds of data help inform the team. Um, they all see them in relationships with typical peers in a school environment, in group settings, um, within their classroom or maybe in some activities within the school environment. All of that information really, um, you know, I, I challenge SESPs to get involved and to contact the people who are working with the student on a regular basis and get that informal uh, data. So that means contacting people within the schools, working with the social worker, talking to the therapist, contacting the residential staff that we talked about, getting the data that you need to see is how's the student ha uh, managing? Um, are they able to handle the work that they have right now? Um, we we have the word down there, homework, but it's really like, what are they doing in the home? What is their skill base? Um, we're really trying to provide the types of settings where they can develop skills that'll help them navigate. Um, because at age 18, they can sign themselves out of the system and be on their own. And we want them to have the skills to be able to be successfully on their own. Um, there's a wonderful um, uh, website here. We're going to go to the skills library. And within this website are opportunities for uh, the SESP or any adult that is working with the student to um, tease out what, what are some of the jobs that a student might have and what are the skills that you might need. Um, I'm going to click on one of them here that's veterinary assistant. And it'll bring up a job title and description, um, and someone who is has defined what is this job for them? What do they do on a regular basis? Students in the system may not have the opportunity to go out and do that informational interviewing, which is so essential to finding out what what's this career all about. Um, and so here is a little bit of a description about what that job would entail. So the student has some information to be able to say, this is something I really would like to try or maybe not. It also has a skills profile with um, a very, I think, unique visual so that the individual can um, 
understand that maybe they don't need to be that artistic to be a veterinary assistant, but it might be more physically demanding. Uh, they might have to have um, uh, more coordination using equipment, um, working interpersonally with people who are bringing in animals and whatever, so they can just get a better sense of what the job is all about. Um, it's kind of an online um, interview, uh, informational interview. So you're really giving the student an opportunity to have experiences in the community without going out into the community. It's also a real great um, a place for the SESP and the student to start the dialogue because sometimes it's like really hard. What do you want to be when you grow up? You'll get that blank stare and I don't know. Um, so here's a here's a way for dialogue to happen. Um, Within the website, there's also um, a skills page and a blog. Um, I love the seven skills for parks and landscaping because there might be a um, an idea that the student wants to work outside and work with their hands. But now you're looking about careers. What other types of careers um, could you do other than just mowing lawns? You could have a career within um, a... A unique field and to have them understand what careers are and um, what real jobs are out there, giving them a broader sense of opportunities within the community. Um, Leslie, can you tell the, the audience where exactly this um, particular skill building place is? Is this part, part of the Department of Education? No, this, this is its own site, right? This is its own site. It's called okay. skillslibrary.com. It's okay. a website that I've gone to. Um, there are lots of them out there. We just wanted to show you one website okay. to give you some of the tools that you might want to use to start the dialogue with your student around careers. They also, if they have access to the internet, either in school or in their residential setting, can do some of this on their own. And I think that's really great to empower a student to say, you know what, I'm going to give you some fun homework. Why don't you check out a career and report back to me next week? And what career did you decide to look at? What did you learn about it? And would this be right for you? Um, that whole concept of career is maybe a new concept for a lot of these students that they never saw themselves moving into a career. It's more than just a job. So now we're going to go back to our PowerPoint. And um, Jane, I think you're going to talk about the, the um, young adult readiness tool that yes. DCF has for these yes. students. This was actually introduced last month, uh, again, by Michelle Banks from DCF. Um, it's, a, it's a nice little uh, assessment tool. Um, it's several pages long. It, it does um, a lot of functional assessments for the kids in congregate care or in the foster care system. Um, it also talks about uh, the, the hopes and the goals. Um, and it's I like it a lot. And um, it's something that is a, another useful tool that uh, the um, people can use that are uh, working with the DCF um, kids um, and share. Uh, with the team. Um, an SESP um, is somebody who could take a look at that and uh, share it, uh, the results with the team uh, when, they, when they work with it. Um, I think essentially the residential facilities are the ones that are facilitating the tool itself. Um, it's not a school-based tool, um, but it's certainly something that is worth sharing with the team when it's completed. And it's also the same kind of thing as any assessment. It can be updated on a regular basis and um, brought up to date uh, as, as the student moves forward. And I think that's one of the keys about when you think about assessments is that you'll take some initial assessments, but as you're going along um, down the road, that there may be different assessments that are more age appropriate um, at different times. Somebody is asking whether or not the DCF assessment tool can be used for students that are not part of DCF, um, and I don't see why they wouldn't be. Um, I know there's a concern that um, it's not statistically um, 
it, it's not a heavy statistical assessment, um, and but it certainly could be uh, another part of the whole toolkit for assessments. Um, so if anybody is interested in it, um, they can either contact Michelle at DCF or uh, we also have a copy of it. Just give me an email and I will send it to you. I, I think it would be interesting for um, everyone to look at and see where is it yes. going and what does it say. There are yes. other assessment tools that probably cover similar material, yes. um, exactly. but they've just defined, defined one tool that mm -hmm. at least that's a minimum um, that uh, standard that of questions that might be relevant to help the planning process. That's right. So the people that have asked for it, I will capture your names and send it to you. Anybody else, just give me a uh, give, shoot me an email, um, and I will send it out to you. So we're going to move on. Um, the slide in front of you is um, the model that the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education has put out to kind of define transition in a one one pager. Um, you'll see the student. Um, armed with self-determination and their vision um, and what they want to do in life, um, moving from one side of the sphere to the other, um, moving and transitioning to post-secondary success. Um, around the whole model is the family, community, and adult services. Um, only on the left side will we see the school support. So moving into the adult agency, you'll lose the support from the school system, but you'll still maybe have some community and adult services. I think the key for the students in the foster care system is the opportunities funnel, is that using opportunities to help inform the student of, of you know, what, what I like and what I don't like, until you have that opportunity um, to maybe work in an environment working with animals, you don't really know if that's a, a, a great career opportunity for you. So their opportunities may be more restrictive um, to access community-based uh, career or other opportunities. And that's where I think it would be um, most important for the SESP to think of creative ways that you can use the school setting to create opportunities for learning and growth for students. Um, so just to, in summary, the transition planning form, moving that into the IEP, the team will discuss it and complete it first before the IEP, the vision statement and what the student wants to do, their post-secondary goal, um, will move from the transition planning form directly to the vision statement on the IEP, the disability-related needs are skills that may be brought onto the IEP, the team will decide what are the priorities, because you can't do 10 or 15 different goals, you might you know, only have four or five, um, which ones are brought onto the IEP and done in that next annual period, um, and that they're really focusing on building the skills. What can we teach the student this year to bring them to next year and building on those skills? Um, and so all those IEP supports and services really need to be consistent with the student vision. Um, we also want you to be aware that the school district is responsible for providing programs for older students. These are students who, after completing the four years of academic studies, um, have other options. Um, these students may or may not um, uh, graduate and receive a diploma, but they're still entitled to receive transition services up until the age of 22. Um, so that could be some other types of continuing education, um, community services, accessing independent living skills, um, self-management of medical needs. If students are on medication, they really have to understand, um, you know, how to self uh administer medication that they're um, taking, um, and developing those skills necessary for uh, seeking, obtaining, and maintaining jobs. Students who are um, remaining within the school system and receiving transition services don't necessarily have to stay at the school and take a life skills class for the next four years. It's really the team's decision is what are the unique needs of that student and what are the programs and services that we can provide for them either in district or out of district. Um, so those are all ongoing opportunities to interact with the community um, so that we really want um, you to be aware that we can define uh, an, uh, a unique program for these students. 
Um, the goal we, we talked about earlier that they can transition out of DCF uh, custody and care at age 18, but our goal is to really keep them in school, keep them learning, keep them um, accessing services, um, and being supportive in their development and their learning. Um, we also want you to be aware of a process that's called Chapter 688. It's really a two-year planning process. Um, and at the time, two years before the student is exiting the system, um, whether it be at age 18, because the student says at age 18, I'm out of here, I want out, I really want to get a job. So they might be called in earlier, or if they're staying to 22, two years prior to exit, um, the school will make a referral to an adult agency. Um, and I really think that the SESP should be involved in understanding if that referral, the form has been completed and that referral been made. And what it does is it notifies the adult agencies that, wow, we got a student coming and we need to plan financially in our budgets for resources for that student. But it's also to have them come to the team meeting and help inform the planning process. Um, when this referral happens, um, I just want you to be aware that it's really not a continuation of special education services. It um, has an adult eligibility determination that will take place, and it's really not an entitlement of services. Um, so there is more information um, online about this, but it's really a planning process again to um, notify adult agencies that the student might be coming. Um, I think the next slide is all the different Massachusetts adult service agencies. Um, a lot of these students may be referred to the Mass Rehabilitation Commission, or MRC, um, which will support um, employment um, op opportunities for these students. And so if, if this is the correct referral for this student, for the agency, I would kind of make sure that they've been invited to their meeting and that they come to the meeting um, because they might be involved in some pre-employment um, services or identifying some needs for the student or uh, opportunities for the student to get um, some services prior to moving into the adult agency. Um, Leslie, someone has asked to clarify um, the statement regarding services to students that have um, received traditional diplomas. I think that wasn't quite clear. Um, and she's saying that her understanding was that the services are available only when transition services had been inadequate and they're uh, qualifying for compensatory services. So if you can kind of clarify about the diploma versus staying on, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we do have a couple of slides about graduation diploma, um, but you are eligible to receive transition services until you accept a diploma or you exit the system at age 22. Um, there are, have been some um, case law, and it's really case by case, if a student has um, completed the requirements to receive a diploma and is eligible but has not received any transition planning and transition services, that there may be a, uh, an agreement between the school system and the uh, family or the SESP acting in place of the family to continue on with transition services, that they would not accept a diploma and that they would get the appropriate transition services for that student to make that transition to adult services. Is that a common occurrence where there's compensatory services offered to students that didn't get uh, appropriate transition services? Do, do either of, do you know, Jennifer? I guess I wouldn't say it's common. I, I think we at the Federation get a lot of calls from families who are very concerned that they feel that their student is set to graduate but doesn't really have the skill base to be able to access a job or to be self-advocating uh, or to be successful in a uh, some type of other educational setting. So it's very individually driven. Um, I think for students in the foster care system, you can make a great case that they need additional supports and services. Um, so it really depends on what track. A lot of these students um, might be go staying in school longer because they haven't um, completed coursework. You know, they've been transitioning to multiple different schools so that they may not have finished those four years of English that are required. So it's a case-by-case -case basis um, and individually driven. and um, 
anyone's always welcome to call the Federation and discuss an individual case that we're, you know, happy to talk about, um, you know, where that student falls along this continuum. I'll just say one other thing that I feel like I'm seeing in the field is um, sort of this element of the fifth year. So it's still the idea of not accepting the diploma, but making sure you kind of stay for that fifth year because if you you know, GM pack everything in the four years, a lot of times and you're in, you know, regular academic classes, you're not getting transition services. So that's what a fifth year can do for you to get some more community-based services. But it does come down to not graduating necessarily with a diploma uh, and sticking around for another year. And we had a call this morning about social graduation. So it's now in the law that students who do not accept a diploma and um, can have um, the right to participate in a social graduation. So they can really graduate with their friends and still stay on that extra year and get the support and services that they need. And it may be uh, in, the, in school or in another setting. It might be a training program. Um, so exiting high school, here we are, you know, what is a diploma? What does it mean in Massachusetts? So you always need to meet your local graduation requirements and your school's uh, school handbook will outline what are the requirements for that educational uh, environment to graduate. Um, most of the time it's like three years of math and three years of history or social studies, four years of English. Um, what are those local graduation requirements? Um, and the student also has to meet a competency determination by the state, and that's really passing MCAS. Um, even though we are testing the PARC test um, in a lot of school districts, students must still pass MCAS, 10th grade MCAS, to be able to graduate and receive a diploma. They need to pass three different MCAS tests, math, English language arts, and science, um, and meet a, a certain level score. If they're very close and they haven't um, uh, received, say, a score of 240 on their math MCAS, they may be placed on an EPP, which is an educational proficiency plan. Um, that supports the student to receive extra math support to be able to um, move and take um, the uh, MCAS. Usually the, they they retake tests, they'll retake MCAS in 11th grade and 12th grade. They, you know, they'll take it three times. Um, they might get some remedial support. Um, and after three times taking um, MCAS, they also can participate uh, in an appeal. Um, I see there's a question about the law citation for social graduation. I'm sorry, I'm not really good with numbers. I know it's Mass General Law, Chapter 71. Um, B, I think it's section 16, but if you email me, um, I will I'll, um, send you the specific uh, law for that because um, it's, it's really great to have that when you go into the meeting. Um, so to exit and receive a diploma, you need to jump through these hoops. Um, there are some alternatives to a diploma, and a lot of students, um, because they've been bounced around a lot, they're tired of going to school, they're tired of going to classes. Um, can they get a credentials to say that, well, they've met the standard of what high school um, academic coursework is. What's really interesting is getting this credential, what used to be called, what is called a GED, we have another name for it in Massachusetts now, it doesn't terminate the student's rights to FAPE and transition services um, so that they can pursue um, a credential uh, and, and access that type of testing and still get transition services. Um, some students may just receive a certificate of achievement, they've attended, they've you know come to school, completed courses, but haven't passed MCAS, you might get a certificate, but just be very aware of the fact that certificate is not an equivalent to a high school diploma, which is a lot of times very important in accessing certain jobs out in the community. Um, Massachusetts has moved from a GED, which is a, a different type of um, outside testing, to the high set test. Um, this is an equivalency to a high school diploma. Uh, a student has to be verified, go through a verification of eligibility. And what's very interesting is that they can't be in school when they're taking this test. So my advice is that they let the school know, I'm interested in taking the high set. How can you support me in taking the high set? And, you know, what do I need to, because to, it's an academic testing 
um, environment. I need the skills to be able to pass this, but they have to drop out of their school program, access the high set test, and then uh, what's really interesting is whether they pass it or not, they can always go back to fulfill and complete their transition services, complete that year of that fifth year or that sixth year. They can go back to school. The granting of a credential uh, of a GED or high set does not terminate transition services. And the students who need accommodations can get us accommodations on this, you know, standardized test. So Jane, I think you want to take over on tips for advocacy here. Yes. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, and we are getting close to the uh, to the one thirty mark. So if you do have questions, um, type them in, and we'll try and get to them. Um, but just to kind of summarize some of some tips for advocacy, whether you're a teacher or a parent or a SESP. Um, number one is the self determination um, and self advocacy on the part of your own student um, to involve them at as early age as possible and prepare them to start um, advocating for themselves. Don't ever accept low expectations from anyone about uh, your student or the student themselves should never ex um, accept them. Um, always think about what happens when your student turns 18 and this is particularly true for kids in the foster care system. It should always be something on the back of your mind about okay where, what's the permanency plan for the student while they're in care and what's going to happen when they turn 18. Um, and we want to make sure that the uh, data is starting to be collected, certainly by 14, and continue to be collected and updated. Um, we don't want to make the transition planning form a stagnant uh, mandated document. Uh, we want to make sure that it's an active document, a, a work in progress every every year. It's re reviewed and renewed. Um, work on that vision, everybody, because of the foreshortened future of these kids, um, and and celebrate and you know, all that those high fives and the praise for kids um, who have achieved even the smallest uh, successes, um, especially for kids in the child welfare system. Um, yeah, I think we're building their self-esteem as they absolutely. go through here yeah. um, and, you know, creating that vision might need a little bit more support. Um, our last slide here is all about planning a life. I'm looking at education, employment, independent living, community participation. Um, if you are constantly thinking of a lot of things here and bringing it into the planning process and bringing it into what are the skills a student needs to get um, you know, competitive employment and to understand how to shop for food and, you know, um, plan recreational activities, have a real life. So this is just that wonderful slide to pull it all together in your planning process. So we have a, a few um, resources that are listed here for you. Um, we have had several we uh, webinars on transition in the past, the April one from DCF, uh, the July one um, from 2014 where we talked about a student-led IEP that's all about self-determination and self-advocacy. Um, and I think that the Department of Education is going to be more active on the whole self-determination piece. Um, our website, the uh, Recruitment Training and Support Center's website, uh, we have a lot of transition resources. DESE is always coming out with technical assistance advisories. Um, there was one just recently in, in April 9th. You can go ahead and take a look at those. Uh, the, the other two are very um, uh, user-friendly, and I, I suggest that people access them and read them about transition planning. Good. They're really good. And um, we have the June 16th webinar coming up. Please, you'll get an invitation, so just sign up for that. And then the two-day uh, federation training called Planning a Life. Um, I don't think we have a schedule for that yet. We don't have a schedule for next year. It'll probably be coming out in early fall. You can check our website. Um, we have both um, parents and professionals there. Um, two days of soup to nuts transition planning. Yeah. Okay, so we, it is 1.30, and we understand if you have to sign off, um, but there's still quite a few people on, so we're going to try and answer a couple of the questions that have come through. Um, one of them is about funding, um, and this always comes up about 
uh, what, who pays for transition services that are outside the school, but have been determined by the team to be necessary to develop skills? If it's been determined by the team, the school educational team, that it's necessary, then that is a school-based service. Um, now, I know um, there are some other um, options for students um, in custody of DCF that, um, for example, if they took the high set test, DCF would pay the $100 fee for them to access that. But if the team determines that this is a skill that they're it's working on in a school-based setting, the school would provide the funding for those services. But in the community? Even in the community, because that's where, where, they're, available. They're, where they're available. Okay. Um, and that um, may be something that we have to fight for or not. I don't, I'm, I'm not that familiar with this, so. If it's on the IEP, um, it would be a service that the school could pay for. It's the bottom line. <laughs> it, it is thank the you. bottom line. All right, thank you, Jennifer. What legally they are required to do if it's on the IEP, then um, then they'll pay for it. Okay. Um, and the other question that came in was about um, transition assessments. Um, who determines what assessments should be done or um, will be done? Is it the school? I mean, it's a team decision, right? But what if the parent is insisting or the SESP is insisting on an assessment that the school is not capable of performing on their own? Well, just because the school says we can't do that doesn't mean it can't uh, can't be done. So the team determines, you know, the assessments. But like any parent, you can ask for an evaluation and sign the consent form. So you are requesting that the school evaluate this student in the area of X and Y. So that's just an, um, um, you're, it's, it's similar to any type of evaluations done. If it's if an evaluation is like the career interest inventory survey that every student in high school is done through guidance, that's they don't need your consent to do that. But if you're looking for a specific area to be evaluated, then the SESP can sign a consent form and get that evaluation and request that evaluation. Is that still considered an independent evaluation? No, that's asking the school to do the assessment or bring somebody in to do the assessment, and then there's always that right for an independent assessment okay. in those areas. I, you know, I, I think you you need to work with the school to determine how best to get that information um, in, okay. in specific areas that need to be addressed. Okay. Okay, it looks like we're out of time and the questions seem to have mostly been answered. I did get, I'm writing down all the people that are requesting the um, the assessment tool that DCF uses, so uh, I will get those out to you. Um, and I think... I just want to uh, remind everyone that um, they can call our call center here at the Federation and um, also um, access um, our new transition specialist, Jennifer Stewart. Yes, and I think there's a final oh, slide. I'm sorry. Yeah, oh yes. Oh. Um, there's our that, that's the RTSC email address, um, and also we uh, there'll be a survey monkey in the email around the, the webinar. Um, so um, thank you everybody, and we'll see you again next month. All right, thank you Leslie, and thank you Jennifer. Thank, thank you. you.